Hello and welcome to our international evening here at Lurch und Lama. Uh, I'm really happy for this evening. I'm looking forward to talks like this for so long. And now the time has come for tonight. I have two wonderful guests with me. And um, this, this special format is because of you, my patrons out there, because you asked me for talks like that. You asked me to invite people from the world to talk about role playing in their companies, in their countries, not companies. Okay, countries. Uh, well, if it's Shadowrun, then it's the same. Um, <laughs> so um, I've invited two wonderful people and we already started talking and uh, a lot. Um, I invited two people who can talk to us about role playing in Israel. And um, I might say that nobody here in Germany, well, nearly nobody knows about role playing in other countries. Well, in Austria, maybe or in America, but not in other countries in the world. And so I invited Aaron and Iran, Aaron, how is it? Iran and Asia. And we three will talk about role playing in Israel. I would like to start off by you two telling the people out there in the stream a bit about yourself, who you are, and what connects you to role playing. Maybe we start off with Asia. Uh, without telling them, of course. And the other thing I do is I do um, extra hour hobbies for uh, kid groups where I do um, d and with them. And that's mostly what I do. Oh, and also I have a, a podcast slash broadcast, which I have comedians playing for the first time, um, sort of a role playing game. Um, and we are running the fourth campaign right now, finishing tomorrow probably great i i always wanted to to invite german comedians uh to to my stream maybe someday in future uh well uh eran hello how about you who are you and why are you here first of all i'm 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 not here i'm in london i'm not even in israel uh okay i am yes so at least at least some of us um, my name is uh, Iran. I've been professionally into role playing games since 2002, more or less. I'm 42 since uh, yesterday. Um, and I have been part of translating or producing basically every role playing game, not completely so, but almost all role playing games since then in Israel, in Hebrew. Uh, I wow. personally, yes, I know that which shows you something about the scale <laughs> of uh, the the number of uh, players in uh, in Israel. Um, I've I've personally translated by by most of most of the books probably. Uh, the okay. latest one is um, Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. Here it is in the Hebrew edition. Um, and and beyond that, I had a, uh, a store where we sold mm -hmm. some uh, role-playing games and etc. for two and a half years uh, in uh, the middle of Tel Aviv. And and that's basically, these days I'm an editor mostly, but also writer, mostly for um, companies in English. Like mm -hmm. I've, I've written some stuff for Goodman Games and, and Mongoose Publishing, and I'm editing for Son of Oak. But I keep translating to Hebrew, uh, and and I'm I think I'm still very much part of the Hebrew clique. I think people would say so in Israel. Uh, I'm still producing a, a Hebrew podcast, one of the only two that exist, um, 
I have been doing it for eight years now, maybe 10, actually. And um, yeah, that's about it, I think. Wow. Okay. So so this is great because uh, here in the chat, we have uh, the, the newer Israel and the older Israel <laughs> and the even older German role playing. Um, so um, looking at the role playing in Israel, uh, Eran, you just said you translated nearly every role playing game in Israel. Yes. Are there games that are origined in Israel? Okay. Um, very few. Um, first of all, because no one really, I think, knows how to sell games in Israel. Mm -hmm. and that's always been tricky. Uh, if the game doesn't have Dungeons and Dragons on it, it probably won't sell well anyway. It's really, really tricky. And these days, for example, there are two main games that you can find in the shops. One of them is Pathfinder for Savage Worlds, which has a huge dragon on front. And the other one is a red box. Mm -hmm. Just like the D&D red box, the same sort of, because that's exactly why I would they... Have, I would have brought it. Because I have one here. Yeah. Okay, I, I have one as well. Um, oh. I was I was part of it as well in the production of it as well. Um, so you have a, a Hebrew red box that is uh, right now sold. Yeah, it's not the D and D. Uh, it's um, Swords and Wizardry. Yeah. Swords and Wizardry. Okay. Yes, it's a translation and adaptation, a pretty big adaptation of that game into a starter box, and. By obviously not by a big company, uh, yeah. by some a few a few guys that decided to do it together. Um, I am, but but you have asked about about games originally from Israel. Um, may, maybe one or two who are very which are very small. There's something called Mizama um, Spamia, which is I don't know how to say a Spamia in in English. I think it translates as because it's, it's a just, word. Just a Spamia, right? Uh, yeah. which is a conspiracy game um, by um, um, Michael. Um, and and there may be a few more. Well, City of Mist by Amit Moshe was... This is what the Czechs just wrote. Yes, yeah, uh, is like originally from Israel, but it never came out in Hebrew. Uh, okay. Because there's no reason for it to come out in Hebrew. There's the starter set in Hebrew for free. You can download it from... Uh, pen and pen and sword. It's called Et Vacherev, Pen and Sword um, PDF store. But uh, you, I don't think you can even find a print edition, which is like a tiny little thing. No, almost everything in Israel is uh, translated. And also, like we, at least in in my tables, we sort of play in Hebrew, which is sort of an English Hebrew yep. mix because nothing or at least almost nothing is translated. Um, so we ought to have like this sort of half translated game, which we take English words and turn them into Hebrew verbs. And it's it's quite a mess, but you get used to it quite fast. It, it, um, Asia, what games, uh, as, as you are sitting uh, right now near Tel Aviv, um, which games are played mostly in the Israelic um, role I mostly play D and D personally, and also like the community around me is mostly D and D based. Um, I guess it's some um, sort form of laziness, mm -hmm. I guess, um, and it's convenient for yes. the the people around me and me as well. Um, I also have the podcast, which has lim some, some sort of a lowered or simplified version of D&D. We like have a D20 base of like su success and fail. Um, and, and that's mostly it. I, I've tried different methods, but I couldn't connect it in the, mm -hmm. such a deep level like I have with D&D. Uh, how did you get in touch with role-playing game the first time in Israel? Okay, so um, we have a big thing where 
people have companies for kids to play. So I mm -hmm. started around the age of nine and played for a few years in like, um, with kids that I don't actually know mm -hmm. or knew until then, um, with some, uh, DM that was put there and sort of did his thing, I guess. This is how I started. And later on I saw, um, it, it was the 3.5 edition. And when mm -hmm. we changed to the fourth, the end the edition, I took a break. Well, I thought I like quit. Like everyone, hey, like yeah. everyone doing the fourth edition, just hey. quit it and started again with the fifth. <laughs> I will not, I will not, I, I do not approve. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying it from my experience, because okay. when we got to the fourth edition, I was like, well, it doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. I can't do this anymore. And I was like, I'm going to quit. Later on, found out that I just took a break. <laughs> um, but this year's like few years after the fourth edition ruled and reigned, um, I started doing a uh, LARP mm -hmm. stuff and then returned back to the table. Um, I think it was uh, mainly around the COVID because everyone stayed at home, mm. but it was a bit before that. But I, I can say for sure that some of my current campaigns flourished in that time because everyone was at home. And also all the um, digital platforms like World 20 and stuff. Yep. Yes. Um, there, there's something I have to, to dive into. You say there are companies playing with kids and doing role playing games okay. with them? I'm it's really I don't think I can explain it. It's like sort of um after curriculum hours thing. Yeah. Like kids would go to play basketball in a group which they okay. like train in. So it's sort of like this only I, I for have, D &D. I have something I think that it, can work. There's a mm -hmm. problem. In Israel it's it's a pretty common thing just after school activity that yes. um, in Hebrew, there's a word for it. It's called Hug. Yeah, and I, I it doesn't translate. It doesn't translate because it's a concept that doesn't really exist in, at least in the UK and, and America. And it would be anything. It could be like you go and learn English to, you know, or get chess. your chance, but or just for chess, or you go for a swim lessons or whatever. It's some sort mm -hmm. of enrichment usually. Okay. And the... And it's really common in Israel, have been for many, many years, um, to send your kids to role-playing. Well, the, it's almost always just called D&D. &D. It doesn't really matter what they play. Yeah, they, they call it D &D. yeah this is how I started. It's synonymous in the world. Uh, we, we just, uh, I told you before we started this year, that we were at the Gamescom, a really, really big uh, gamers uh, event. And when we talk to people, we ask them, have you done role playing before? They say no. Um, we ask them, have you done D&D? They say yes. So uh, they don't even know the world word role playing game. They they just say it's D&D. &D. So I think that's that's in all of the world. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and, and we've talked a bit about it before we started how D&D is almost its own hobby, different from other role playing games. Um, but in Israel, it's, um, the, the main thing is currently these days, and again, I think have been for the past 20 years, most players in Israel are kids around the ages of seven to 15, something like that. This um, is so cool. It's weird. Well, but seven is quite young then. It's like there, but there are, nine but there are, to 17. Yeah. You know better than me. You know better than me. And, yeah, and it, they stop I, playing? I have like seven groups that I'm running currently, like once a week, meeting for an hour and a half with kids that range from nine to, okay. I guess, 17. And I um, also have one nice thing, which is a family that for a family night, ah, they, that's really good. they like, they have, they sit in front of their computers and we play and I, I run them a campaign and they all like two parents and two um, children, which is quite a family activity, which this is cool. I, and and you can be, jealous. you can be booked. You can be booked as a, as a DM for this family events or. 
um, it, it quite it changes, but uh, usually we have like a specific time and date that we schedule like um, okay. Friday afternoon and this is their family time and I just run the campaign for them. This is so cool. Um, so do, do people stop playing, doing yes. role playing games when they get adults? Yes. Why? There are two main reasons, I think. Asya can correct me. Um, I think the, the first one is because you learn how to be a player in a hug, you don't really learn the basic skills of how to uh, entice your friends, how to excite them to join a group, how to create a group. It, these are very important skills, social skills that a role player needs. Uh, where to find other role players, how to find new systems, how to run a game, stuff like that. You don't learn it. For you, the game begins and ends at the hook, and therefore, it's not your hobby. It doesn't become a hobby. And if it doesn't become a hobby, you're not a hobbyist. You will not be playing later on. Unless you rediscover it again. That's a, but, but, but yeah, that's... it has some sort of a glass ceiling where, which... If you're really into it, then yeah. you will like continue exploring and finding out more with yourself as an individual, going to conventions and uh, LARPs or uh, finding a friendly table. Uh, but yeah, it's some sort of a block. Um, the other problem is, uh, and again, as you can correct me, is the IDF uh, because at... yeah, it's the biggest LARP I've been yep. in. Uh, it's uh, famously. <laughs> Uh, the IDF, everyone in Israel, I mean, not everyone in Israel, probably less than 50% of the population, uh, once you put, once you actually look at it. But generally speaking, people in Israel, once they get 18, uh, get conscripted to the army and have to do mm -hmm. three years in the army, away from their friends, under specific, uh, you know, schedules and the like. And it's really, really hard to play during that time. Uh, mm -hmm. You really have to rediscover role-playing games after you're done. So the, I think these are the main two things. Okay, the, then these three years are uh, some kind of a break in everyone's life and you have to reorder yourself after Basically. these three years and Basically. look what you have to do with your life. Is it like that? Basically. Wow. This sounds... Really hard. Was it hard for you, Asia? Uh, it depends. I think so. I think so. It depends. Yeah, it's quite hard. Yeah, <laughs> but it depends. <laughs> it, it's it 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 sounds to me harsh that you are a, a child till one day, and then you change and are a soldier, and then you change and you are an adult. Look, it's... and and this is it, this is just. Just how it how it sounded it's to me. It's complicated. Okay, it's, complicated it's always <laughs> it's a big complicated thing. Uh, to say nothing about how, well, again, we can talk about the morals of it again for for uh, as well. I, I, I think that's a different topic. Yeah. Uh, maybe we shouldn't touch it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you rediscovered it after your army time. Um. And you say there's a big lab in, in lab scene in Israel? Bigger than, well, you see, a tabletop people, they just sit at their homes. So they're quite harder to put into statistics. But yeah. when right. you meet people at a LARP, you see them in like real life yep. and you are aware of their existence. And yeah, there are some few um, companies and there were a few games that are um, annual. Um, and yeah, I started like around 16. I sort of maintained some form of um, role-playing hobby while I was in the military, um, but it's quite harder, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot harder. Um, and then later you are free to do whatever you wish. I flew to Old Town and last year to Drachenfest, which was amazing. And one of one of the biggest in Germany, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was very uh, impressive and the size of it, it's quite um, really amazing. Um, 
magnificent even um <laughs> and i went with a well there were a few israeli groups that flew separately like few uh camps and mm -hmm. i was part of the uh, alderdach uh, town and uh, it was quite wonderful experience unlike mm -hmm. not very similar to the larping experience experience in israel um what would you say are the differences um, I guess you Germans are quite more into deep role play as um, more of more Israeli um, players are like chill type role players like they're sort of in game sort of out game sometimes yeah uh, tend more to be uh, fun and I don't know tend to just uh, swift up off the game sometimes and into the game. Uh, but there are serious uh, players and, mm -hmm. um, that are into deep role play. It's just the generalization. Uh, yeah, I think the the uh, German big events like uh, like the Drachenfest, uh, they have really tight stories where you can be in game just the whole time you are there. Um, great. Um, so, I just I just have to catching up on chat. Uh, uh, yeah, a bit. Um, how how do people in Israel look to role players that are adults? So so um, about to to adults doing child games I, I, this this all sounds to me like role playing is a child game in israel because you do it um uh, in the kutz so, is it right uh, hook. 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 Huh. Hook. yes i really wish um, it was an english word yeah um i think that uh, most most parents don't really know what what they're sending their kids to um and i think that most kids don't really care so it's not like if you would say, I mean, probably if you'd say to a person on the street, D&D, uh, &D, they would think about, ah, yes, my niece is in a hook or something like that. Um, and they don't know what it is. It has dragons and swords or something, and they roll dice or, or something. And it was on TV. Someone saw something like that on TV lately or something like that. Um, but the hobby, the hobby is quite mature, I think. The hobby okay. itself, the hobby scene. Uh, um, are there conventions? Yes. Yeah, I have. Well, just um, last week we had a DMing um, perspective that, convention uh, beyond yes, the screen. Beyond the screen, that's a, that's an uh, an unusual thing. Okay, so so generally speaking, there are there have been three conventions, big big conventions running for the past sort of 15 20 years the, the probably the largest is icon uh mm -hmm. which is and the, the israeli convention for all uh sci-fi stuff mm -hmm. sci-fi fantasy all the geeky i think uh, i think area. It, it leans sci-fi but maybe it's just my 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 thing could about be it. I, I know a lot of like um anime cosplayers people right there's also it's anime. really diverse yes it's the whole it's like when you go in the streets and there is icon, you might go like in some form of an outfit related to role playing or cosplay or something. Yes. And the people around there, they know it's like Purim, which yes. is Jewish Halloween. Like, uh, yeah, Halloween. They know it's that once, like Halloween. once yeah. a year there is sort of a different geeky uh, Halloween. Yeah. Uh, that people go around looking weird doing it's, it's a big thing and it also i mean they have academic lectures and they have a uh, showing of um uh, special editions of um uh, movies and they bring directors to talk about it and it's it's a big thing and it's it sort of also has role playing games uh it's not like the points of the convention but it always has role playing games a lot of them and they are always full mm -hmm. um so that's been running since the 90s another one is bigo which is not in hebrew world it is literally big israeli gathering of role players <laughs> bigo i was i wasn't aware yes 
uh, after Ego, which was before that, which was, was just an Israeli gathering of four players, <laughs> which was pretty small. I mean, they had 30, maybe this 80 This is so people. great. So, uh, so there was Igor, and then it was and then Bigo. Bigo. And then there was Bigo. And Bigo has been running every Passover. Passover is sort of like Christmas in Israel. It's yeah, when the family yeah, yeah. meet, and then you have a, a bit of time off, and you can do stuff. Um, and Bigo has been running every Passover, while Icon is at the start of the, sort of around the start of the Hebrew year, which is almost six months. I mean, it's like the... the, the, the um, you have two events every year, six months mm -hmm. apart. Mm -hmm. um, and Bigo was only role-playing games. And it has tons of them. And, exp and uh, if you wanted to do experimental stuff, you would go to Bigo. If you wanted to launch a new role-playing game, you'd do it in Bigo. If you wanted to do uh, cool shows and events and lectures, you would do it in Bigo. Bigo sort of died off during COVID. And yeah, like many. for that as well actually. Um, it's just that less and less people were excited to come and organize the convention. Uh, and there was uh, there hasn't been any big for the past two years. The third one is in the summer where the kids are, uh, you know, have their summer vacation. And it's called Draconicon, which is a con with dragons. It's just like Draconicon. And it, it is, it's run by a company Unlike the other two, which are, are run by uh, non-profits, organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not a big company. It's the same company that translated, I mean, I should, should, should say, it's the same company that translated this and the same man that paid me for to do this, just to be clear. Um, and the Conicon is started off mostly role, um, board games. One, while the board game scene in Israel grew and grew, and it's really big these days. Uh, it, it, it is finally a thing uh in israel for actual real you know board games and board gamers have money and they can pay for it and they are looking for the event where they can come to and play with other board games and bring their family and oh they're also role-playing games in this event so the conican became a role-playing it, it, it started as but now it's a pretty big not as big as big o um not nearly as big as icon but it's the second best thing after I After guess Icon. it's it's a bit more luxurious, I'd say, from the last Draconicon. I well, the last one was really they moved to a new location. Yeah, it was in a amazing. hotel, which was yeah uh, on on the on the beach in Tel Aviv, which yes. was quite impressive. I don't know how it is in Germany. Here in in the UK, you do conventions are a thing that happen in a convention center or in a hotel's convention center. In Israel. We don't this have any, much. I think. This costs too yeah. much, and we don't have any. I mean, the, the only ones that you have are for the for the Eurovision or something. You're not, yeah, yeah. You're yeah, not I, in, in Germany, it's it's quite similar. The the role playing conventions are in schools or or in some kind of uh, of uh, uh, community houses or, or things like that. Uh, yeah. I want to come it's back to a question. I. I asked that was not quite answered. Um, um, how how is in the is Israeli mainstream um, role playing viewed at? I know when I started role playing here in Germany, I um, I had to go um, and it it was in the eighties and uh, role playing was nearly unknown. And uh, our our um, there was this satanic panic, where uh, people thought about what are you doing there? And I I had to go to a psychologist to talk oh. to him uh, okay. what we are doing a, a school and children psychologist not okay. not to get a therapy but to to tell him what we are doing and the, that we are not bringing Satan to the world, which is quite funny that uh, they really take this for granted that when children are encountering something that there's a danger of uh, satan coming which is another theme but um how is the the israeli mainstream looking at you if you were just in a family meeting or if you talk to to people you just met in a club or something like that well i'm doing role-playing games as a hobby uh, 
it could well there are two ways to look at it first one could be a bit um patronizing uh or maybe even sort of going to the uh kinky meaning of role playing this is sort mm -hmm. of thing well if you go to a bar and talk to someone uh having a small talk about role playing this is could go there um for people who know what it is it's sort of a still geeky stereotype um but it is it, it's becoming more known but i have an anecdote i was in uh an israeli game gaming show like um not trivia but uh riddles and puzzles mm -hmm. and i was invited because of the podcast and to talk about myself and my geeky hobbies and another larper which i knew was invited but at the final cut, we were edited out, even though we were talking because about like the thing, it's a, because it's, it's a, still not mainstream yeah. enough. And it was, yeah, quite disappointing to be frank, yep. but yeah, because it, it seemed as though the producers were enthusiastic and enthusiastic about this topic and they really wanted to, for us to share it with, uh, um, the, the, you know, the normie, the regular people community. But uh, I guess they chickened uh, at the last minute. <laughs> okay. I, for, from what I know, it's not... I mean, there's no stigma around it. Uh, mm -hmm. there, some people might have some stigma about it. But generally speaking, it's the thing, a thing that geeks can do. It's probably... It's not for me. It's too much imagination. It's too much... Uh, yeah, but the second perspective... Stuff? I, I was uh, about to talk about is the thing is that sometimes we use role play as a tool in in a lot of things that we do like in the IDF going back to this we have like a lot of uh when you do uh not a rehearsal and um like uh, having this scenario of something happening and they you but, have mm -hmm. people role playing as um you know uh, injured and stuff. okay okay but would you say that's actually how people would react when you tell them I, I would D &D? have, of course not. Okay. But it it is used as a tool. Well. Oh yeah, which... yeah. I think I think that actually role playing is used and and is accepted. The the the, the act of role playing. Yeah, very like much. my daytime job where I do the murder mysteries. It's sort of more normalized. Of course, mm -hmm. and escape rooms. All of right. it is is normalized. But I'm. I think that the hobby. If you tell someone yeah. that I do it as a hobby, that will be a. That will be looks. Um, when I when I look from my perspective, and I only know Israel from uh, TV. I've never been there, as I said. Um, would you say that there is these pop cultural center, Tel Aviv, and the rest of Israel? Which are a kind of two things. Yes. I th yeah. that's, but that's true for everything in Israel. There's Tel Aviv and there's the periphery. Okay. And <laughs> that's, that's basically how it is, I think. I mean, okay. again, Asia, correct me. But I, I live in a periphery. I moved from one community to the other one, and I still find myself, uh, well, in all sorts of matters, but in the role playing and the tabletop aspect of it, I come back, I drive once uh, every other week to Tel Aviv to play with my friends because they won't come here where I am. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. And yeah. Also with doctors and education and stuff. But yeah. It's, it's, a, big thing, well. it's a big political thing in Israel because the periphery is. Um, they're not getting the budget they, 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 mm -hmm. they deserve. Yeah. Uh, sort of. uh, yeah. And the question you asked before we started is now asked in the chat. Uh, 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 someone in the chat is wondering about the photo of Jerusalem I take uh, and not wife. Tel Aviv. Uh, that's, that's your wife. wife in the chat, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I considered um, taking this picture because here in Germany, uh, I wanted to tell something that says, well, Israel. And um, the the skyline of uh, Tel Aviv is not so recognizable to people yep. here in Germany as this picture is. So this is why I decided to take it just for the marketing. Um, so how big are the conventions? Uh, the 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 bigger. Um, what? How many people are there? Um, I'm going to to the Dreieich convention tomorrow. Um, and there are 
due to COVID, we we uh, don't have the the full amount of tickets, and there are about a thousand role players per day coming there to do role playing groups. So, um, how big are the conventions uh, um, in Israel? That, let's say that's about the same scale as you would find in Bigo. Okay. Uh, there, are, there are way more people in Icon, but not all of them are role players. Just yes, just a few. Um, but conventions is probably again because Bigo sort of got decimated and, and into nothing. I think that it says something about the trend in Israel of uh, where role playing is going, and always has been a very personal thing. There are conventions, yes, but so many groups, for example, I, not a gazillion of them, but there are many, many groups that have been playing AD&D for the past 20 years and they're satisfied and they don't want anything else and they have no reason to go to any convention ever. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many groups that just they, they don't hang around in Facebook, which is basically the only place where those uh, role-playing game exist. I mean, the, the, the social scene in for role-playing games in Israel is probably two, yeah. three groups in Facebook. Um, and if you're not there, you wouldn't even know about the conventions. Um, but maybe you have been playing uh, isochronously on, in a forum game uh, with your friends, something based on an anime, and you saw some critical role sometime, and so you, you have a sense of how to play role-playing games. And you and your group of 35 people have been playing there. I, I, I say it because I, I'm i aware of such things existing ever since I had a store in I 2007. I was such, a sort of an, like game gamer, role-player of this type. Okay. Mm -hmm. For a, a specific uh, time in my life. but Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you don't uh, stay in the S form for anime. usually yeah but the thing with mixed convention the good thing is you can snatch people which are sort of like uh yes. book fantasy uh readers or something similar and then you can snatch them. them and Take be them. like let's try Let, you want to try and we have uh, i had in less icon which was uh, two months ago i think yes, two months ago. i had um an open table which was um which is supposed to teach, you know, newbies how to it's, do um, everything. Yeah, we've been for many years. We've we've called it uh, missionary games because <laughs> because it's we were trying to convert, uh, you know, non non muggles. They are they are geeks. They are not yeah. our geeks yet. We need yes. to convert them to our geekery. We've been doing it for many, um, but the name is tricky, so we stopped calling it them. And now it's like gateway games and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, gateway. It's what it's, it's called right now. Yeah, gateway games and missionary games, and yeah, this is uh, um, this is interesting because in in Israel it's just like the same like is here in in Germany um, that we we try to reach people and tell them how great our hobby is. Mm. and how much fun is and how how much they can they can take to their normal life uh with role playing um if only more people would listen <laughs> yes but they do we just have to go and and this is and uh, meet them where they are yeah yeah and yeah, this yeah. is one point for this uh mixed conventions that are really great yeah. you just have to go where people are you can expect them to leave their home and come to you and ask, "What are you doing there?" Yep. And this is just, just, just the same where you are uh, than than like it is here in Germany. Um, so there's uh, D and D. Uh, you would say is about ninety percent of the people are playing D and D. Probably. And do you are there? Also, some some science fiction games played, like like Star Trek, well, Shadowrun, things no, like that. Not really. Science fiction is really not popular in Israel in general. Not just in the oh, wow. game scene. It's a, the concept of science fiction. Everything science fiction -y is really really rare. Um, wow. You just won't really find it. You'll find almost anything that has um, a. A fantastical element is literally fantasy of some sort. And you can see that in role-playing games as well. 
I've, I've come, obviously people are playing other stuff, right? There's no, it's not like there isn't any Eclipse phase group in Israel. There probably is. There are probably Shadow One groups in Israel as well. Um, but it's so rare. It's so unusual to see such a thing. And this no um, sci-fi game has ever been translated to Hebrew um, because there's really, it makes no financial sense. No one will buy it. Uh, is it is it also in in um in cinemas that uh, science fiction is not popular? Well, if it's if it's from the USA, it will arrive in Israel. <laughs> so and okay, I, it will arrive there, but but is it is it taken? I don't know. I don't know. What what do you think as you're uh, uh, right now living well, in Israel? It, literally, sci-fi is not personally my cup of tea. Um, Aha. And, yeah, <laughs> as as you can see, I'm probably <laughs> part of the uh, you know uh, people, and I thinking of it as an a medium. I think that we had few um, fantastical um, uh, cinema, like Israeli cinema stuff, mm. but not any sci-fi Israeli stuff. And I think it's a medium that is much less explored here. Um, I can't see why, um, but I don't I, like it personally. <laughs> my wife is uh, um, a doctor for English literature, uh, specializing okay. in uh, fantasy and sci-fi and the like. And she says currently in the chat, and she's correct, sci-fi, uh, science fiction literature written originally in Hebrew is also extremely rare. Yeah. This is, this is, Really, really interesting. I think, I think that w there's a lot of anthropological studies that can be done about it relating to um, Zionism and the the whole culture, the Israeli culture and why it prefers fantasy and and current interpretation of Judaism and stuff like that uh, over science fiction. Uh, but it's probably above our pay grade. Maybe, but this is this is when when uh, talks like that get really interesting. I, um, I, I uh, when 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 you think about why is it so so uh, in in Germany? Well, uh, fantasy is the majority of role playing games, um, which is because the first role playing games all were fantasy games. They have the longer history and more people play them. But I think uh, that. Um, Shadowrun is something that is also quite popular here. And um, then there are these these games like like the alien role-playing game from hmm. Sweden, from Free League, which is quite popular. Really? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, what about Cthulhu and uh, the, the horror role-playing games? So um, in the 90s, there were sort of like two or two and a half main... Um, I want to say factions uh, among, again, the hobbyists, not, I, I don't know about other people, but in the, the, the um, among the people who were part of the community when there was basically only one, um, there were the people who played D&D, &D, but there were, there were very few of them because most people would play not D&D &D because, you know, And the scale is tipped like, as uh, time passed. I, I, I also think that most people actually play D&D, just not in that group. Uh, in okay. the community, it was important not to play D&D. &D. It was, okay. it was a, a social thing. As Because well, thing. Cool, cool kids are doing the, sort the of. new I stuff. Mean, it it yeah. was 20 years ago. And what you would play is World of Darkness. Yeah. Um, and and horror games, which is also World of Darkness. Um, so so th there's a lot of... I. Uh, Things have changed a lot since then, and I think that very few people actually play World of Darkness today. But it's still it's still a thing, especially in LARPs. There's a World of Darkness LARP that has been running, I think, for ever. Um, and there's, and I mean, people know of, of Call of Cthulhu, and I bet that some people play Call of Cthulhu, but I can't say that it's a thing. Yeah, uh, even in Germany, we have uh, hard discussions about uh, the the whole work of H.P. Lovecraft and what an asshole he was as a human being. <laughs> I, I think... and, and so so uh, maybe 
is there a connection in in uh, Israel from Cthulhu and Lovecraft and what a kind of asshole he was? I don't think anyone cares. I mean, it's really easy to separate the the men from. I never from separate, his work. and it's okay. Well, it, I guess it's the differences because I I am young, I know, mm -hmm. and I I don't separate someone from their work because they existed together. Uh, I assume, but I do have the cooking book. Necronomnomnomnicon. Necronomnomnicon. Yeah, 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 I, 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 also, I, I also have it there. Uh, but okay, yeah, Asya, my the... question is, my question yeah. is, does that mean you will not play Call of Cthulhu, for example? Um, specifically, I'm usually looking at it in the other media types. But okay. yeah, I'd say that I assume I won't. Okay, okay. It's a big discussion in, in Germany, and there are some role players who said you should not touch these games because of who the inventor was and from from what kind of mindset the whole Cthulhu uh, okay. universe comes. And the others say, well, he's dead for over a hundred years. I don't care anymore. I the, think the, the guy is gone. I think that that discussion is important for only one reason, um, royalties. Like if you if you buy something that someone would, I, I don't want to get into too much politics, etc. But for example, I would not buy anything by J.K. Rowling these days, right? Because she will literally get money and I don't want her to get my money. I don't want her to use it to advance whatever things that she wants to advance. But he's been dead for 100 years, so that's not like a consideration for me over there. What you said at the start sounds really interesting. Like how might there, might there be racism ingrained in in the things that he created? And therefore, if I'm playing it today, am I encouraging racism in my game? I mm -hmm. think it's an interesting question. But I also think that we are at a stage where we do have, for example, um, uh, cultural editors, also known as sensitivity readers and the like. I mean, people who literally specialize in knowing this as a profession. And I sort of trust them. I mean, I, I have no other choice. I can't analyze Call of Cthulhu and see what the problems are in it. I know that when a Call of Cthulhu book comes out, it really needs to have a paragraph, like at the start, something explaining about who the man was, because it's really important that we know that. We, we, that's just a fact that cannot be separated. The fact of who the man was cannot be separated from the book. But mm -hmm. I think that the content itself of the mythos can probably can be. Um, but I don't know if it can or not. I leave it for the professional to decide. In any case, I don't play horror, so all of this is mute. I don't... I really matter. like horror, but Me mostly too. I don't use a specific um, type of game, except for... Uh, I Ten Candles. I think, no, Dread. Ah. Ah, okay. uh, oh, Dread is such is a great so game. so fun. Um, I just, like launched i i had like one game with my friends uh quite recently and it's really fun like uh using their paranoias for your advantage and stuff and yeah. also the stakes are really high yeah, yeah, yeah. The game, it, it, you actually feel the adrenaline this is why i really like this um uh, i you really should i think you should check out 10 candles if you haven't okay yet. i'm writing it down you ten you should candles. Yes. Ten, 10 candles is uh also a really great i i have i'm, I'm just make a hobby hobby of it to have most of the role-playing games that there are and and uh these are two that are really really great um, there's a, a quite of special question uh, mm. in the chat. Um, in Germany, role players are often judged by conservative parts of the Christian church. So um, conservative Christians are looking down on role players, um, just judging it as a demonic, satanic hobby. Um, can, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I can understand can... where it originates from what you spoke about the yeah yeah uh, going to a psychologist psychologist yeah to can you analyze. can you tell 
I just read the question. Can you tell what a conservative Jewish view on our hobby is and what a traditional rabbi would have to say? <laughs> nothing they don't nothing. care they don't, they don't care. care i don't think yeah no um, so okay we, we should really differentiate there are a lot of types of judaism actually yes there and are. for example first of all uh i think most players are what we would call chiloni which is secularist they don't mm -hmm. they don't care um there are many people who are what we call um yamaka wearers they they they, they have a yamaka they are quite traditionalists they they would call themselves you know proper jews they 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 have rabbis they go to uh um um synagogues and temple yeah etc uh, etc yeah. et um and they don't care as well it's totally fine it there are matter. some but like, exactly layers there are layers and the more you go and it really depends on the rabbi and the generally speaking the harder you go you can go all the way to um orthodox i think i think they are called orthodox uh ultra orthodox maybe uh the guys that walk with black hats and black yes. coats and you never see the women <laughs> yes um so they these guys would never play anything at all that is relating to role playing games uh it it is in their mind probably uh, not satanic because that's that's a very christian concept yeah but it is it wastes your time. It's it goes against God. Uh, you should be spending your time in something pure and thinking about the Torah or something. And there are people who are uh, there are rabbis who lean toward there, and the rabbi leads the the people who follow Fort. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the problem is more the time you invest in a hobby that is not invested not studying in the, the Torah. Yes, studying that's the, the Torah. Yeah. Uh, they would also uh... look on football. Yeah. 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 It would be as problematic. Yeah. Okay. Really interesting. Uh... It's, there, there's a really, really big difference in the mythology of Judaism and the mythology of Christianism. There's yeah, just there is. no e big evil guy. There's, there's no such thing. So you can't just blame all of your everything that your children are doing that you don't like or understand on something like that so it doesn't work <laughs> the big back bad we are evil so so not uh the, and there's the, no the sin even okay so for example there's also no concept of sin so there's no inherently i'm bad and i need to atone or stuff like that or i'm bad i, I need to behave or whatever okay wow big stuff big stuff yeah i i love talks where everyone learns something this is so great you um when when we talked just the 15 minutes before we started you uh, told uh, me something about some kind of role playing storytelling technique um right. you you uh not invented but uh okay. just brought oh, it to okay. the people yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah of course okay 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 uh, not of course, you have your own opinion on this, and it's interesting as well. Um, there's, um, there has been, ever since those days that I've talked about 20 years ago and the guys that didn't play D&D, they have been talking a lot about role-playing games, and they've been studying and trying to understand role-playing games. And that's like, I guess, not a unique thing. But in the ecosystem and the Fury ecosystem in Israel, they developed a specific sort of line of thought that has been on bordering on semi, I mean, really semi-professional in the way that some people are, are addressing it and taking it seriously and analyzing and understanding it. Um, and in the last few years, they've been coming to some, like five, seven years, they've been coming to some very interesting, I think, directions and thoughts and even concepts because once you have yeah. a word for a concept you can start talking about it and it's really important uh that has been uh, we think i say we because i have some some a little um, um I, i'm i'm touching on 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 the sides of it i mostly just encouraged and have them translate some of their works to english uh it came out in on gnomes to you uh, like two years back a mm -hmm. series of three uh, articles where they try to explain the Israeli worldview 
uh, like how there's actually no such thing as a game. There's actually no such thing as player characters. And it's important to understand that. Um, one of the, probably the most, I don't know if the most useful because I, I have some other concepts, but the one that we talked about before, which is a very useful concept, is a guiding action. And that means any action that you hopefully do um, consciously, it can it can be done unconsciously, but then it's just it it's it's something you should be conscious of that directs the game. Actually, it will be more correctly to say the people participating in the game toward a specific desirable outcome. And that sounds quite vague, and that's a problem. But I can give you an example of a few, and you will try to understand what, and you, you will get will get the feeling of what's going on. So one of them is, for example, rolling behind the GM screen. When the GM mm -hmm. rolls behind the GM screen, that is, you can we would call it a guiding action. But also rolling without the GM screen is a guiding action. Both of these, if done consciously, direct the players toward a specific direction. For example, without the GM screen, you are broadcasting as the GM that you are to be trusted. Mm -hmm. Behind the GM screen, you are broadcasting as a GM that there's something that you are unaware of. Um, there is, it, 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 this, this is like maybe the simplest way. Um, there are also, there are also things like, for example, while you are describing a room, giving very little attention to the presence of a door, literally like putting it, and even in intonation, making sure that you put it in a place in the sentence where it, they, they will realize it's there, it will be part of the imaginary space that we all inhibit, but they won't give it any attention. And then you can use it later when they didn't guard the door because they didn't give it attention and something comes out of the door. Mm -hmm. Or you can do the other way around and give just a few more details about the door, making sure that they will that will be the first thing they examine. Because once, for example, you enter a, um, a, um, a room, there's a door to the right, a door to the left, and a red, big, majestic door to the front of you. Which is the first door you are going to examine? You're going to examine the big, red, majestic door because, because I gave details. So all of these are tools that you can use. But these are like the simplest one. For example, there's a really good one that uh, Hagai Al Kayam Shalem, which is one of the group of people that, that wrote this, came up with, which is while having a conversation as an NPC with the players, you stand up and go to the back of the room and make some tea for yourself and come back. And this is while while all of this while still talking with the with the players this is a simple thing that looks like it's out of the game like the the gm wanted some tea but it is also literally making the players thinking about how this person is so easy in this space how sim how how we are all have to sit here where he just goes and brings himself some tea and he stood he stood next to the kettle while it boiled and he he did whatever he wanted uh, and he, he, you know, he went like four or five meters away from us and we sort of had to shout it for him or raise our voices for him to hear us. And that's put us in a smaller place. And that may give the NPC uh, what we call in improv uh, a higher status. Mm -hmm. uh, and the NPC doesn't need to do anything. The NPC didn't do anything. But the players... I mean, the NPC didn't talk like, da, 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 and there was no intonation. There was nothing. The GM, maybe the GM doesn't know how to do that. Maybe the GM doesn't can't do the voices. Here's another way to do, to get higher status. Okay, so okay, I understand. It requires no voices. For example, do you use that for your games, Asia? Um, actually, yes. <laughs> Uh, mostly I do have more of a charismatic theatrical DMing qualities, uh, since this is my personal background. Um, but sort of fortunately and both unfortunately at the same time, 
my the comedians I play with, which aren't um, originally uh, role, role players. players. Yeah. yeah, there are there human beings that were inserted <laughs> into this. Not scenario. role players, but human beings. Yeah. <laughs> this is a difference. The, I yeah, mean, no. of course. Um, so the thing is, they sort of discovered my secret language, my subtext with them, the mm. guiding actions. And they use it as if I I am talking out loud. Like mm -hmm. they will address it, and they they'll say, "Well, y y why are you rolling? Like, is there anything coming?" Or or they they will actively um, turn into my actions, and we relate them to what is going on in the adventure, which is quite because. It's quite, like I said, fortunate and unfortunate at the same time, because I know I can convey messages to them through yes. this language, but also it's much harder hiding stuff. You, you sort of yeah. lost And manipulating as... them, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really it becomes harder manipulating them. You lost them. these these actions as tools to uh, for for un for, for them to be manipulated without their realization. But then they yeah. sort of switch to a place where you can use them to manipulate any other in a different way. But yeah, yeah, you you can like sort of take the other end and like manipulate them through using those actions. For example, oppositely. Yeah, like, yeah. This is um, this would be my them. suggestion. Just uh. <laughs> Just do things they they don't expect in in this moment from your NPCs. So uh, m maybe the NPC is uh, nervous not because he is lying, but uh, because he knows he has a date in two hours, mm -hmm. and uh, this is why he is nervous. Uh, this this uh, yeah, this sounds great. Is is there? Uh, do you? In your group, uh, often change the DM chair, or is there one DM and players? Personally, or like in Israel, both. Uh... <laughs> I guess there is there is this cliche of a forever DM. I don't. I really don't. I'm not aware if it's an international thing. It is. Uh, it is okay. Then uh, we sort of have this um, stay like a very consistent DM. But lately we, at our campaign, like I said, personally, um, we decided it would be really nice freshening up things if one of us were to take the lead mm. in our character to be uh, unpresent and for the DM to play some sort of a half NPC related to the world, um, sort of cultivating uh, things that should happen, but mm -hmm. also as a player, uh, to enrich the world that we're playing at, but mostly, yeah, there is a specific DM. It doesn't usually change, and the wisdom of how to be a good GM is past. Like I know, I consult with my uh, forever DM for mostly ninety-nine percent of my game problems, my table problems. Um, but yeah, uh, you know. Um, it's really hard changing the forever DM for a, a yeah. new one or for switching with the person, the other persons in the table, because um, you're getting really used to their type of conveying a story. I, I think I'm a terrible player mm. because I'm much too active as a player. Um, and and I tend to take over the story. This is this uh, makes me a terrible player. I'm. I'm Were quite... you told this, or do you feel like it? Because I know I feel like it, but um, some GMs would actually really like that. If that. Um, the 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 problem is, I think there are other players who tend to go in the background, go more in the background. If you have a player that, like me beside you. Um, less, um, yes. I have to to uh, willingly stop myself and give actively the focus to other players and just play them and say, well, what are you doing uh, in this situation? Or what what are you telling me about this and that? Um, this is um, it, this can be a problem because uh, 
introverted players, they have fun, but they lean back and watch the story uh, and not so much play the story when they have such an too active player like me on their side. Yeah, but I think that you you only see it because you have the DM perspective. Right. And in, in <laughs> that perspective, you are more con to um, grabbing those more introverted players into your role-playing type and inserting their stories uh, into yours and your characters. And since I passed to like beyond the screen and also started DMing, I, you know, you understand most of the language, the subtext you speak with the person behind the screen. And also you can encourage your friend PCs to, to yeah. do more in character than yep. like put the spotlight than like in a very artificial way. Yeah. Yep. So uh, one hour flew away in, in a blink of an eye. Uh, this was so so interesting. I got so many new stuff that I've never heard of, that I never knew. Um, and um, now I'm even more looking forward to go to Tel Aviv one day uh, just to see how it is and how the nerd culture in in Israel is. Pretty um, much in your face, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I would really love to see you on a nerdy event, maybe here in Germany next year. Um, I'm not such a LARP. I've never been to a LARP myself. You should come. It's like it, I've it's I've done fun. nights. I've done nights tournaments, but more uh, for show with horses and stuff. Um, but um, not in in the way of a LARP. Uh, it would be terrible if me and my guys would ride with horses and lances in, in a lab battle. It sounds problematic, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like we would could kill people that would, would not be so much fun as people The insurance think. is probably going to be the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really big problem. Um, but maybe we, we see on an event here in Germany or in England or maybe in Tel Aviv someday. Um, I really, I'm really grateful that, uh, you were here. And, Thank you for uh, inviting us. Yes, it, very it was much. such a pleasure to talk to you and to get to know something about uh, the the Israeli nerd culture. Um, great. Can, can I have a request? Yeah, well, of course. Can the next one or or something that, that talk with people from around the world can it be with the Japanese? Because I, I would I, love to know more about that culture. I'm I'm working on on uh, on uh, far Asian on on East Asian. Amazing. Uh, I I don't have some right now. What I'm um what will, I will have here is um a guy who built the biggest role playing community in Turkey. Okay. Um, they are about 5,000 people in this community. Nice. And uh, he will uh, come to our streams together with his uh, professor from the university who've done a research on role playing in Turkey, which will be really, really interesting. And I'm awesome. working on, on a role playing company in Ghana, Africa, um, and the, the uh, Far East. So, so, uh, Japanese, Taiwan, something like that. Hong Amazing, Kong. Uh, but I don't have already one from from uh, Japan. But I will get some. I'm sure one day I will have some. You'll get a high enough roll, and then yeah, yeah. <laughs> what one day I've I've get a streetwise roll that is high enough, yeah. and then I will get a contact there, and and maybe in the end when I've talked to the Turkish guy, to the African people to the Far East people, um, and I'm I'm quite done with this series of uh, podcasts, streams. We will all meet up together for a Let's Play. Yeah. <laughs> this, this would be great. This is a great, great idea. An yeah, international we... Let's Play with people from America, Israel, Turkey, Japan. That's a, that would be you interesting. You could actually examine like the differences yep. in dynamics exactly. live. Yes. We, we speak about it in theory, and it's much, I guess it, it would be a lot different if we, we actually play together. We would need to sit down afterwards and like <laughs> review the, um, the, the, the video and, and. This would and be great. A, a worldwide 
let's play with you and people from somewhere else on the world and the hours do... would be insane however yeah that yeah. Thing. yeah yeah but <laughs> there, this is one event yeah, yeah I, I, would, it, it. I would i would if, if it if it would help that i should wake up at one o'clock in the morning for it yeah. then why not for one event i, I, I think this i think i've never seen something like that it will be unique so uh this is this is why i want to make it because it's unique Excellent. no one has done this before so maybe maybe we'll get this an international let's play from all over the world and uh, with these words uh i hand over to you the the last words always belong to my guests uh do you want to say something to the role plays out there maybe watching this on youtube um I, I want Asia to have the literally last word. So um, may may I plug something? You may say everything you want. Booby 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 boo. Um, I wanted <laughs> I wanted to say that. Um, okay. I have um. I have a web comic about role players. It's been running for five years now. They've been playing okay. Savage Worlds. Uh, they're literally playing Savage Worlds, and the web comic explains how to play Savage Worlds. Uh, this is it's cool. An, it's it's really good if I can say so myself. Uh, it's in up to four players dot com. Uh, Just well, would you hand me over the link? I would. If you're right now, up can you four players dot com? I've put it up in in the. Uh, in uh, you the can't. Chat. You can't just. Uh, oh, only I. This is why I asked. Uh, oh. up, then why does it appear up okay. to four up to four players dot com? The four is the word for, although actually yes. the digit works as well. I just found it. Uh... Doesn't it look good? <laughs> I'm I'm the writer. I'm not the artist. Um, that's up to four players. That's a web comic about role players playing an actual game of Savage Worlds. Um, it's um, it's a lot of fun. I think we actually created the role-playing game for it based on Savage Worlds, uh, Crystal Heart. It came out on Kickstarter a few years ago. That, that's, I think, my plug. The only thing I have to say to people at home is um, play nice, be kind, find someone new from the family of friends and teach them how to play. It can be D&D, doesn't matter. Just make them play. That's it. Thank you. And Azi, are you? Um, we didn't manage to insert the topic, but I really think you should normalize women and girls playing role playing games. Um, I've had a few like best, really enjoyable game, really enjoying games with uh, all female cast of player characters and um, also a full ga game of women playing. It's a really interesting dynamics, which I would have told you about if we've had the time, but uh, I really I, I urge you people uh, women play role playing games. It's fun. It's amazing. Don't don't let yourself don't be hard on yourself and and try it if you're a woman and guys don't be dicks. We're part of the community. We're part of the hobby. We are here to stay and just don't play like assholes. That's that's what I'm asking from my experience um, and an agenda. So yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you are you are so right, so hundred percent right. And uh, one thing one thing I can say to that is, I think in the end you will win this discussion because look at us three. There are two old guys and one young woman. It's just a matter of time and this world belongs to you so um we we are just we are just leaving you are coming so um you are so right in telling that um i think this hobby needs to get more diverse it's starting to get more diverse um we've done the first steps but we should take even more of the steps it's not enough right now but we will. I think the world will, in the end, be a better world. So, with these words, we just say goodbye to you people out there. Um, thank you that you all watched and listened to us. I know you are usually getting German content here. 
today it was English content. Um, yeah, but it was great content. Um, I say goodbye to you, um, but not forever. If you tune in tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we will start streaming from the DreiEichCon directly here near Frankfurt. And we will not stop streaming till Sunday at six o'clock in the evening, because uh, by night, the Gary Con from uh, Lake Geneva in the US will take over the stream and do our night program. And in the morning, we will take over from them. And you can have role playing game for more than 24 hours at a piece. So just tune in tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thank you to you two. You were wonderful guests. And thank you to all your people out there. Um, the last words, as always, belong to our patrons. And I would like to say thank you.